Cherie Prince, thank you so much for coming on the Inner Edison podcast today. Well, Ed, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> You're so polite. You are definitely, <laughs> so, it's, you must be a Southern girl. I am. I am hailing from the great, the beautiful metropolis of Flowood, Mississippi. And how many people are in that metropolis? A handful, but they're lovely people, all of them. I'm in a town of 230,000. Oh, yeah. We're way less than that. Um, Probably less than 100,000. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Everybody polite like you? Pretty much. But, you know, I... I, I may be considered the cream of the crop. I'll go ahead and take that. Okay. It's just, you're just very polite. So I appreciate that. I'm, I'm an old grumpy old sailor guy. So, but I'm actually very nice, but so let's get on. So before we were starting the podcast, we've been talking about a lot of stuff about how, how to protect yourself. And that's kind of what we want to talk about today as an entrepreneur, you're going to come across issues that you have, and there's ways to protect yourself, pr protect your personal assets. Also, so that you don't lose everything. Is, is that kind of where you are? How long have you been an attorney? I've been an attorney for about 12 years. Wow. You don't look old enough, but anyway. Well, you know, I'll take And I that. don't mean that wrong, because that now is almost like your age discriminate. No, I just, you know, just don't look that old. So. Well, and I'm a little hoarse, excuse me. But before becoming an attorney, I had a an entirely other life before law school because really? I was actually 30 years old when I went to law school. I had a three-year-old and a six-month-old and I had just come off of losing a business. I had two mortgage companies and this was around 08. We had the big mortgage debacle. You're and talking to somebody lived through the whole thing. I've been in this industry for 27 years. So Yeah. But the difference probably between you and I is that I did not see it coming. You know, I was rocking and rolling one day and then things slowed down and they slowed down a little more and I didn't see it coming. And so I was, you know, I had to pivot and I started law school after then. That's funny because when I went through that, I was looking for the first year. I was like, do I want to go back to school and become an attorney? And then I talked to so many friends of mine in Rotary who are attorneys and just talking to them and they're, they don't, they wish they would have done something else. And I think it just depends on who you are and what you, any, any industry you get into, it's about the individual and how, what are you going in there for? I think. And I guess with me, um, I'd wanted to go to law school for some time and life just took me in a different direction. So now fast forward, I have these two little people who are looking up at me that I have to feed and I'm trying to figure out what to do. I have the life experience. I have job experience. I had it. I had an MBA. And I could not find work. You know, companies were closed. I just couldn't find work. And I knew the time was going to go by anyway. So whether I was in school or not, time was going to pass. And so I just, I pivoted, I applied, and I finished in two and a half years. Wow, that's amazing. That's really good. That's pretty fast. Well, you know, like I said, I had those two little people looking mm -hmm. up at me, So No, because I was looking back at that time and... It was it was a bad time for a lot of industries, not just the mortgage industry, but that was a whole financial mess that we went through. And a lot, and you're right, a lot of there. I had my MBA at the time, and there's no way nobody was hiring. Everybody was laying off, laying off, and so I ended up myself personally got into the short sell side of the business, and I did negotiating short sales, which was the which was to get out of that transaction. That house was harder than to get into it. Right. And so that's what I focused on for the next four years and did pretty well in it. But I also, like you, looked at other things to do at the same time. Well, and, you know, you said that was fast. But when I was in the deep of it, literally, when you're in law school, you can only work so many hours per week. So I couldn't do more than 20 hours. My schedule was crazy. And this is before they raised minimum wage. So imagine being a single parent. I was making five twenty five an hour with an MBA and two kids. So that was part of my motivation to go ahead and get finished. And so, you know, there were some other hot, hard knocks before then. But at the end of the day, I'm grateful because now I'm, actually, I'm absolutely doing what I love, working with entrepreneurs, helping them build a moat around their assets and really protect their businesses. Because in hindsight, I can see that there were a lot of signs that I missed and I did not protect my business. And so I'm glad to share those, you know, positive lessons and opportunities with other entrepreneurs. What were those signs? 
You said you missed those signs. Definitely. When things begin to slow down, rates begin to rise. Um, you know, there was one point in time because I was a broker. Mm-hmm. And so we had, you know, several companies we can get people approved through and things were just not as smooth as they used to be. It was harder to get deals closed. Uh, even keeping up with the local news and just kind of knowing what's going on in the world and how that affects you individually. It's amazing. There are some people that don't, you know, watch local or national news, but all those things affect you day to day, whether you think they should or not. And so when those things start to happen, because I really did not watch my numbers, you know, it was a period of time. If you had a mortgage company, it was just coming in hand over fist. Um, and sometimes you spend it just as quick as it comes in. So, and, and that just happened in the last two and a half years, also three years, because, you know, every, it was, there were so many people who refinanced and everybody refinanced. And now there's no business out there. There's a, you know, a trickle, um, in our, in our County, there's 286 transactions a month going right now. And a third of those are cash. So that doesn't leave much for a 3,100 real estate agents or 1,700 loan officers. Exactly. Yeah. So we're back to that whole situation, not a financial disaster that happened because of the bond rating agencies rated all those bonds wrong. You know, they rate them as AAA when they should have been D's. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just watch the movie, The Big Short. You'll totally understand where the problem was. And those guys are the ones who should have went to jail because they that's who caused the problem. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it goes back to if you're just there for the transaction. You're not looking at that. You're looking at, hey, I'm making this money. I'm doing this. And you think it's going to last forever. Right. Well, that's what everybody thinks. But let's get on to where you are now. Because when you said the signs, I thought there were certain signs that you'd miss that entrepreneurs miss. But let's get into what we don't really take in. You know, as an entrepreneur, we're so busy building something and growing something. We don't always look at our 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 books. We don't look at our, you know, the bookkeeper, the accountant, all those people. We focus on what we're good at and we're not good at those other things. And we need to hire people to handle those things. But it's kind of hard sometimes in the beginning because of just the money's just not there yet. Well, we think the money's not there, but building a business is like raising a child. It takes a village. You know, if you are, if you have a vehicle now, you already have someone that you're paying an insurance premium to. If you're in business, you have a bank account. So you may have a banker that you're already working with. Hopefully at some point during your business, you've worked with an attorney. And if you're in business, you should be paying taxes and preparing returns for the government. What I do is kind of act like a quarterback and I put together an asset protection team for you teach you what questions to ask, how to implement these in your business. If you don't have um, SOPs and KPIs and things like that, I help you with those things. And also the mindset, because, you know, a couple of the main objections I get, well, I don't have enough money. What is it costing you not to work with these individuals? So I tell folks, treat it like a wellness exam, at least once a year, make an appointment, talk to your team and, you know, check on your financial health and the financial health of your business. All right. So SOPs, you're talking about standard operating procedures, right? Standard, I just want to be clear op- because not everybody understands acronyms and I want to make sure we, and KPIs. Key performance indicators. And that would be. Those are just your numbers. You know, what are your numbers telling you about your business? Do you have, based on your industry, do you have certain metrics that you look at to look at the health of your business? Right. And and today, if people looked in the, who's in the mortgage industries at their KPIs, they would show that there's no health in the business and they should be doing something else. But I want to, I want to stick here with how, all right, what team, so you're in Mississippi, right? That's right. Yes. Right. Do you, are you nationwide? So here's the thing. Attorneys have to be licensed in the state that they're giving legal advice. So I'm a licensed attorney in Mississippi. I can give you legal advice, legal advice in Mississippi. But as an asset protection coach, the things that I'm doing for you, it does not constitute legal advice. So I have people that live all over the country and a few people outside of the country, because what I do is I help you put together your team and the questions. And it's not really legal advice, but it is organizing almost like a business consultant. But okay. a little bit in business. Well, break, let's break that down. So when you say you help them put their team together, do you have your own team or you help them find a team? 
I help them find a team if they do not already have one. Nine times out of 10, you have people in your orbit that you work with. And so I just kind of make that team more cohesive. You know, your attorney should be talking to your CPA or your accountant. Your insurance agent should likewise be talking to your attorney. And these people should have your permission to at least on an annual basis, get together and talk about what it's going to take to move your business to the next level. So you kind of do it the same way I kind of do it in the mortgage industry, which is I have make sure they get set up with a financial planner, a trust attorney, everything that you need, you know, the insurance person all the way through so that everybody's protected and everybody knows what's going on. So it sounds like you're doing the same thing for entrepreneurs to, t- to help them set up from the beginning. This is how these are the people you need in your orbit so they can look at your stuff and make sure you're doing it right. Exactly. And if you already have someone actually, you know, bringing that person on and making sure that they understand if you if they are not already providing the services that you need, like here are some additional things that this business can use. Where do you where do you see the biggest mistakes being made besides not having that team? Okay, Um, the biggest mistake. That was an easy one. I'm not going to give you softballs. I want some bigger stuff. So the biggest mistake. And I don't give tax advice, but excuse me. Have some tea there. Oh yeah, look, let me try some of my tea. <laughs> after I after I had COVID, um, I had to have tea at every one of my podcasts because I I couldn't. It would I have keep that throat moist. It was weird for almost I'd say eight months. I couldn't just talk. I had to have the tea with me to actually speak. Wow. It's the weirdest thing. Like, because we talk so much on here, right? We talk for many hours, and that's all I do anymore, it seems like. And it's it's important because that's it's I would like to have the conversation, but go back to you now that you got your tea. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I see, um, you have many entrepreneurs who do not understand the difference between a tax preparer and a tax planner and the impact that it has on your business. So a tax preparer is looking in the rear view. They are just take they're just taking information from the previous year and providing a report to the government on your activities and what you may owe the government. But a planner is looking straight ahead in the front windshield and that person working with your team can actually make some decisions that will give you some tax savings coupled with some legal protections. Um, And so we really try to, you know, they don't have to be different people, but you need both roles covered on your team. Now, the tax preparer, is that a CPA or is it? Is it, any? it doesn't have to be. Um, there are some very competent accountants that do not have to be CPAs, but you do need to know the distinction. One looks forward and one looks backward. So as long as you, you know, kind of get that distinction and let them know what you're looking for, then, yeah, it does not have to be a CPA. Because there's also what, EAs. Is that what the other acronym is for? <laughs> Enrolled agents. Yeah. Yeah. And EAs are good as well. Um, You know, they don't have to have the same level of training as a CPA. I think they take a, they go with so much time and then they take a test, I think. so. Yeah, but they're very valuable. You know, it's not like going to H&R Block. If you have a business, (laughs) hopefully you are not still going to H&R Block. No offense. No, there's (laughs) nothing there. They're a tax, uh, not a, what's that one you said? Not a tax for prayer, but a tax. Planner. Yeah, they're Plan- not tech yeah, planners. Yeah, yeah, they're just a preparer where they just take what you tell them and they put it in a system and the system tells them what to do. So it's like going to Starbucks for your taxes. Yeah. Another thing that I see a lot of are people that are overinsured. Because if you don't really understand asset protection, some people try to throw insurance at it. And sometimes what insurance will do is make you a target. Um, If you have a location that may be public facing where you get, you know, people in and out of your brick and mortar business um, and they find out, hey, Sam's and I'm just using Sam's as an example. They have a 10 million dollar liability policy. So, you know, maybe I'll just keep slipping and falling because they have this all this insurance. Well, one thing that I work with teams on doing is trying to get you the minimum required state mandated insurance for your business. and with the difference, you can invest that back into your business. But how do you do that? Working with your insurance agent, we can make sure that you have the best legal setup. And what that legal setup does, instead of having maybe one business for just an operating company, we look at a three entity structure. So you may have a trust at the very top, a holding company, and then you have your operating company. 
does not cost a whole lot more to operate these because you're going to have the same people looking at stuff for you. But with the difference in what you paid for premiums, you can put that back into marketing. You can put it into a reserve account. There are just countless things you can do. Invest in equipment in your business. All right. Break down the structure you just talked about. Holding okay. company. Yeah. So if I'm, let's say I'm going to start a company, right? How do I start it properly? One, I recommend one type of business per entity. So, and this is an example I give a lot, but I work with a family and this family had three different companies that were not connected in one LLC. One of the companies got a judgment against it. Well, because one LLC owned all three of those companies, the lien for the judgment affected all three companies. So do you see how that could be a bad thing? Yeah, of course. If you have, definitely. And some people just think, oh, I'm just going to get one LLC and put all my businesses into it. So I tell folks, if you are in business, yes, you want one type of company per entity, but you also want a buffer because you know, who owns that company? I recommend having a parent company or a, or a holding company because they're different depending on how you're using them. Um, What's the difference? Um, I'm sorry. The difference. I'm going to ask these questions because people are oh, going to no, ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's fine. Don't the parent, make it like I'm a child and I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. What do parents do? Parents take care of you, don't they? That's what yeah. they're supposed to do. So with the parent company, think about it, that the parent company may provide resources for their multiple children. OK, that it, it will provide services with a and, they over, and then they oversee it. Right. Is that what the, and then they they oversee some services depending on the type of company. Yes. But there's liability there possibly with a parent company because there's activity within the company. The difference with a holding company, all it does is hold assets. There's no activity. So if there's no activity, there's no liability for suit. You see and the what difference? Would, Right. And how is the, how is it a holding company doesn't make any money from the companies? It just owns the assets or how does that work? It just owns assets. The way that I set them up, it just owns assets. So, for instance, if I had a dry cleaning service that went and picked up stuff, that is the operating company. It performs services. So if I run over somebody or hit somebody in the company truck, the liability is with the operating company because it provides services. All the holding company does is hold assets for the companies that it owns or for companies that it's affiliated with. The parent company, in contrast, may provide some services to their children. And because they are providing services, it opens them up to a little liability. And so what I do, depending on the type of company you have, we just kind of talk about what you need. At the top, it's always your most personal layer. So that may be your will or your trust. And it's possible that you can have more than one trust. So when people talk about having a trust, you can have a zillion different trusts for a zillion different reasons. But minimally to get started, I recommend either a will-based estate plan or a trust-based estate plan. That's the top of your ladder. Then you have a holding company or a parent company. And at the bottom is where you have all of your service-based companies and or entities. Now, does the, how does a trust protect you? Trust does not really protect you. You can get an irrevocable trust and people look at that for some protections. But the way that I like to differentiate a will and a trust, what are your goals? Um, is it asset protection? Because by, you know, in and of itself, it doesn't give you full protection. So if you're looking for asset protection, you may be looking for anonymity. You may be looking for generational wealth or in the case of a land trust, you may have property that you want to pass down for generational wealth. So a trust coupled with other entities can give you some protections. Um, it just really depends. All right. So all the stuff that you're talking about, how to set these companies up and have a holding company, right, to oversee. So what if one of the companies of so these three companies, like you just said, was leaned Right. They, they, it was going under and now they, and they pay, they personally guaranteed one of the stuff or whatever they did. And now it's going to come after them. How does that's going to come after them personally, but not come after the, the other businesses. Right. It depends because, and I know that's not a, an attorney's favorite I've, words. It depends. it depends. Yeah, I know. But preferably if you've set everything up right, 
you should personally be judgment proof. I recommend that if you use a trust that, you know, all the assets that you can put into a trust, a revocable living trust, mm -hmm. that you put those in a trust in your lifetime and you have what's called like a sweep account. So if you know that your mortgage is a thousand dollars a month, your car notes, 500, whatever you need to pay monthly, that's what goes into the account and it goes right back out. So on paper, you're judgment proof. You know, you can sue me. But going back to your original question about entrepreneurs, and this is just, you know, something I borrowed from Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind. You know, when you start a business, your first thought is, OK, because we already know you're the best widget maker in Flowood, Mississippi. No hands down. You're it. But how am I going to exit from this company? And an exit is not always selling the company. Because think about it, if you've been um, in the work in the workforce and say you had a W-2 job, you took your retirement and put it into this new venture. Well, what do you do for retirement to replace that money that you made for your initial investment? What happens if as an exit, you can't sell it? What if that exit is a bankruptcy? That's still an exit. If you have a partnership and the partnership for some reason gets dissolved or goes bad, that's an exit. If you are a sole proprietor or a single member LLC and you pass away, depending on the state that you live in, um, the way that your estate handles your death, that's an exit. So there are several different, you know, scenarios that can be considered exits, but you have to start there. You know, take a break from making widgets and figure out what an exit looks like if you're an entrepreneur. The reason I'm bringing this up is because as an entrepreneur, we take risks. And the risk can come back to bite us um, because of other things that happen. Like, I mean, if you look at what we talked about originally in 2008, when after the mortgage companies, the whole issue, now we have it and we're in, uh, what are we, 2023, almost in 2024. And now we have another problem where no one's doing anything in the mortgage industry. And so they're having other issues. So there's two, you know, two times in within 18, I don't know how many years it was, but 12 years or whatever it is. What is that? 15 years? Let me get my calculator out. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm just saying there's too many. Now you have, you plan on things a certain way you're building. And and like you said, you, you didn't see the signs in 2008. I saw the signs. recently. I saw the signs, but I didn't think it was going to get this bad. I didn't think we were going to get up to 8% interest rates and, and the whole thing that, you know, I knew we we're going to get high. I just didn't know we were going to get that high. And can I give you another example that I don't think many small entrepreneurs consider? So the capital city, the county that it sits in, they had a ransomware threat where, you know, somebody over in Russia and I'm, you know, it really was. They said they were from Russia. Um, they hijacked their systems. Well, they were using a DOS based system. You know, that blue screen where you're typing code in, they were mm -hmm. using a DOS based system. And so think about not being able to record deeds or mortgages or powers of attorney for almost a month. They could not run payroll. They couldn't do anything. And part of the government's um, way that they actually pay employees is the collection of taxes. Nobody can pay for their car tag. Nobody can pay their property taxes. None of the businesses can pay their personal property. And so it was just a really bad time. But if you are a closing attorney who services that area, you can't close loans because now you have a whole different scenario. Um, abstractors can't go search the chain of title. Carriers won't insure it. And, you know, it's just a, it's a trickle down effect. So people really don't take cybersecurity as seriously. And when you talk about putting a moat around your assets, cybersecurity plays a part of it. Um, so does IP. Right. I'm, I'm just looking at because most entrepreneurs, they go in and they don't think about if it's if it's going to fail, like you said, an exit where you this could happen. And, uh, you know. If you listen to the, you know, they say 50% of all businesses fail or whatever the number is, I think it's a lie. Um, I think it is just their way of getting the SBA to get more money so they can use it for other things. But I, th I think it just depends on where you are with your business and how what they consider a business and how it starts and that kind of stuff. But to protect yourself is huge because I know you, you never know until you start building assets and then you lose them how important protection is. And really, before you even start making money, you need to know what's going to happen to that money. So there's an exercise that I take people through called the dollar plan that basically earmarks for each dollar you make. You already know where it's going. You know, where's, you, where's it going? I'm just kidding. OK, 
Well, no, you got, you know, you have your taxes, your payroll, your reserve right. account, and it varies per business, but you should have a basic understanding where every dollar is going to go as it comes in. So you're not surprised. All right. So if someone's going to start a business, because you're talking about tax protection and you're talking about protection of businesses and I'll make mm -hmm. a moat around it. If someone's in, okay, I'm in California. It's not the best state to have because you pay a lot of taxes, but a lot of people will get their corporations done in other states to protect them and then work as a foreign agent in our in our state but you still have to pay taxes is that just for protection purposes okay let me do this because okay. i have i have an exercise that your listeners can actually do themselves and this is what i start everybody out with it's my secret sauce and i'm giving it to you ed giving you my All secret right. sauce. we start out with a decision tree and the first thing is you know do you have a brick and mortar business or is it e-commerce because, you know, of course, the way taxes are handled is going to be a little bit different. Second thing is, um, are you a public facing company or do you require anonymity? If I were someone who had like maybe a tequila, I may want somebody like Kim Kardashian to, you know, promote my tequila because Kim just makes money. Whatever she does, people purchase it. But maybe I'm an investor in a real estate venture and I just want my company to be the owner. I don't want people to know that it's Cherie Prince. So if you require anonymity, in part, that's going to govern where I file your incorporation document. So it's going to be somewhere like Nevada, Wyoming, or Delaware. And then if you are brick and mortar, where are you, what state? Because like you said, there are some states that don't have any income tax, some with no property tax. And so you just kind of go through the decision tree because one thing may weigh more than something else. Your The tax benefit may not be as great as the anonymity that you need for this business. And if you're well diversified, you may, you have other concerns. If you have multiple businesses with competing interests, you have multiple concerns. So I really tell people, if you start with that decision tree, it will allow you to look at everything apples to apples. So if somebody, so when you say for, facing um, say employee, not employee facing, but um, public facing. Thank you. Thank you. So like I have a media company, right. That ha owns all my stuff, right. To mm -hmm. protect it. And cause you don't want to have to, from what I understand, and I could be wrong. You don't want to have your uh, trademarks owned by a person. You want to have it owned by a company. Is that correct? Preferably. Yes. He said, preferably. Preferably. You, I, that's, I know that's a <laughs> nice way of saying maybe. Potentially, it, you know, you know, that attorney speak. Well, it OK, I would say yes. 51%. Okay. Yes. You know, you have the other 49%, <laughs> 51%. Yes. And let me tell you why. Um, if you have a company that just owns IP, that's great, because what you can do with that company, one, the liability you cut down significantly versus having the IP also owned by the company that, you know, provides services. You can lease it. That, you know, you can franchise right. the name, likeness, or image. And so, yes, a company is preferable because when someone passes away, you may have estate issues. If the company is properly set up, you can have that for eternity and pass it on as an asset. Right. Because I don't think people realize that, like, the name of a company could be leased to that company in case something happens. Then you can take it back and move it to something else. And I don't think people understand how to do that. And I found that out. And I was like, wow, that's a smart thing to do. Because then yeah. it doesn't matter what happens to that entity. The name is not associated with that entity. It's at least entity. And I think a lot of people don't understand with companies, uh, you don't, you, there's two people, there's their entrepreneur and then there's a company and you need to build the brand of the entrepreneur and the company separately. And that's, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because one thing that early in my career, I had an entrepreneur come to my office and they were selling their building. And we kept talking. I'm like, are you selling the building or the business? Now, the buyer was about to get a great deal because they were about to get the business and the building. And so they didn't understand that they can sell the building and move the business because the buyer had kind of told them, oh, you got to do both. Because it was a great location. It was, you know, a restaurant that people would frequent. And so I was like, well, you know, you have certain goodwill associated with your name and that location. And that has a value. And they were thinking they had to do both, even down to the phone number. You know, 
it's like that has value. People have called this same number for 20, 30 years, you know, to get a, a blue plate or to reserve, you know, something for Sunday. So um, that's something that entrepreneurs need to consider as well. The value in that. And so did they finally get it set up properly then with your help? Yeah, they did wind up selling both, but we got much more, you money. know, we, yeah, a lot more money for it. <laughs> yeah. Cause that, I think that a lot of people is like, what you're going to pay me for what I just built for the last 30 years. I'm so happy. Someone's going to pay me for this. Yeah. That literally these folks were going to let them have the building, the name, everything. And I'm like, no, you're leaving a lot on the table. Yeah. Well, that's good. At least you helped them there. Cause I, th I think people don't realize, and I said this the other day, I don't know where I found it, but you know, common knowledge that we have, you know, what we know and we think is common knowledge, it, people will pay for because it's not common knowledge for everybody. And one of the things you said in the beginning, I think before we got started about you have a course coming out. And I think a lot of entre people like us who do what we do, we don't realize that we could put a course together and people will pay for it and they'll want to buy it. Um, we have to, you were talking originally before we got on about a coach. And I think it's so important that we have go to masterminds, have a coach, a corner man or person or woman, whoever it is, but that are there to help you grow who you are. It's so important of what we do. And I think we most people don't realize how important it is. I think almost everybody has a coach. I mean, has a course in them. You know, there is something that you do that you're great at. It may be crocheting. It may be fly fishing. Um but I think we most of us have something, some base of knowledge, some zone of genius that we can share with someone to make their life better. Do you mind talking about what your course is going to be or do you want to keep that under wraps? Oh, no, I want the world to know. <laughs> I want, Yeah, I want every entrepreneur who can benefit to definitely do it. You know, these are some things that I didn't know when I started my first business. Um, I was 21, did it with a handshake. It was horrible, ended very, very badly. Um, but it's called the entrepreneur's estate plan. And what it does, it basically gives you a DIY, I mean, DIY, do it yourself, um, way to start your estate plan. So for those of you who may feel like you cannot hire an attorney, you can't get an accountant going, it's just a base way to have a plan so that when you expire, because we all have an expiration date, you have something in place for your family. Um, other than just your business and a lot of questions. So that's what it is. Ed. Wow. You told me, I'm just stuck on the fact that you told me I was going to expire. Well, you know, I could say, you know, go on to glory. That's what we say in Mississippi. Well, when you've gone I, on to well glory. I always say is everybody wants to go to heaven, but no one ever wants to die. That's a song somewhere, but that's so true. Everybody wants, you know, all this stuff, but then we never think we're going to. And you need to set up whatever, especially your, you know, if you own, especially real estate, it needs to be in a trust. And I think a lot of people understand the two different trusts. One is what you set up while you're alive. And the other one is what happens when you pass away and how they have to distribute the trust. Exactly. Because the last thing that you really want your family to do, you know, they're grieving you because you're no longer with them. But now they have all these legal headaches because either you did not discuss, you know, what you want to happen when you pass away or you didn't set it up properly. Right. And that is more of a headache when you have partners and you're trying to divvy things up. Yeah. I mean, especially when you have family who fight over everything anyway, and it's the worst thing that can happen. The best thing you can do is put a trust and everything together because people think a will handles it. Will doesn't handle it. It just tells probate how you want your stuff distributed. And people don't realize that. I think they think a will is what handles everything. No, a trust is what ha handles everything with the will and who's in charge and all that. And I tell everybody, just sell everything and, divvy up the money because people are going to fight over it anyway i watched it with my grandparents and my mom my aunt and my uncle how they just fought over everything well Ed, you must be reading my mail because literally that is part of my origin story you know how i also made it to law school my mom passed away when i was 16 bounced around for a little while you know my dad my brother and i went to my grandparents house and we stayed there for a while and when they passed away 150 acre plus farm well, everybody's doing great, you know, for a minute. But then I have aunts and uncles that, you know, they want the best part of the land. or They don't think you deserve X, Y, and Z. When the truth is that my grandparents died intestate or without a will, without a trust. So the state of Mississippi, they already told us because you know what happens when you die without a will. So you know how it's going to be divvied up. Um, and so that was really hard for our family. But it also taught me that 
I need to have a plan for my children. And so you are exactly right about the will and the trust. Yeah. And also one thing about probate though, it, it tells you and your family how it's going to be divvied up and there's no fighting over it. Right. That's the only positive thing about probate. Not that it's great, but I'm just saying it's, if you got a family, that's a fighting family, there's a way to get rid of it. So. Well, and this is what I find. Um, that's what, you know, it tells you what happens, but sometimes you will get someone who would try to contest a will, mm -hmm. which blows my mind. You know, if grandma didn't want to leave you the tractor, then why are we in court fussing about the tractor? But it happens every day. So if you have a trust, I just I'm a proponent for trust, you know, not saying a will is a bad thing. But if you can set up a trust during your lifetime, um, there is an instrument called a pour over wheel that acts like a magic wand that basically says anything that you did not put into your trust during your lifetime can pour over into the trust. Right. And so there are just so many things that you can do to where it cuts down on the confusion and what your wishes are. But you got to get started. Yes. And also before you get married, do a prenup period. Yes. And prenup. Yeah. I mean, and cause that's when I got remarried this last time we both did a prenup, right? We did it. We we're like, okay. I'm like, if it doesn't work, I want you to have your stuff and I, you want me to have my stuff. So our kids have whatever. And then I married her and I adopted her three kids. So, and now today it doesn't matter anymore, but that's, you need to protect yourself all the way and not do it emotionally. And that's one of the issues is the whole thing. Now, even like you said, you have a trust, people will potentially contest it. And so what you do is you put in the trust. If you contest the trust and the will, you're out of the trust and the will. Yeah. Those I didn't hear about that until recently. I was like, that is the smartest thing to do. If you contest it, you're out. Yeah. And, the, and then also one of the differences with the trust, um, it's like another person in the room with you. And you definitely want to have things that you look at on a regular basis, because when the court has an opportunity to see a cooling off period. OK, so Ed did this trust 10 years ago and everyone had knowledge of the trust. Nobody had a problem. Now it's passed on and you want to contest it, but you did not do it. You did not do it during his lifetime in terms of the way that it was set up. So prenups, all that stuff. You need a cooling off period. That's something that I really advise. Don't bring me the prenup the morning of the wedding. <laughs> it's important, but that's a great you know, defense to get it invalidated is that I was under duress. He told me he wouldn't marry me unless I signed the prenup. So they're good, but just you know, make sure that you do those things timely. I totally agree. All right. So we, what was your biggest failure? Did we talk about that at all? I mean, we're into this about almost 40 minutes, but I know and I, I have so many. I got so no, I know, many. but it's, it's not about having, so I had somebody who's like, well, I, you know, I could have sold my company for $50 million. I decided to keep it and I ended up losing 30 million. <laughs> so, you know, there's, th it, and I tell people, it doesn't matter what it is on, on the internet Edison podcast. I just want to, you know, there's little things that can be a major failure to you. And that's what it's about. It's not so much, you know, I had uh, Brian Smith on uh, the UG founder and he talked about how he lost his company and how he, you know, and then he was on the floor and his wife said, get your ass off the floor and get out there and fig figure the fix this. And he did, and he got the company back over time. That's a huge, but it doesn't have to be. So when, when I ask you people, what is that? It's whatever it is to you. Well, I guess I would go back to 08 because, you know, I went from being a business owner. And at that time, I had multiple businesses, multiple rental properties, and I was doing well. I lost everything, Ed, like to the point to where I had to go live with my brother for six months. Um, I did not have a vehicle of my own. I had to like start over. And once again, I'm making five twenty five an hour with an MBA, all this experience, I also have my real estate license, but because of everything that was happening in the mortgage industry, I had to start from scratch. So, you know, when I was going through it, it felt like my biggest failure, but really it was probably a great lesson. And I know this is not, you know, the Christian channel, but if you're familiar with the prodigal son, you know, you got father, two kids, you know, one that was loyal to the dad and one that said, you know, I want my, inher my inheritance right now. He gave it to him. He would out and blew it. And so at the point that he was humble enough, the other son who blew his inheritance to come back and 
because he was living bad after he lost everything. But his dad was able to see him in the distance and prepare a feast for him before he got there. So part of me having to deal with all that, I'm at a point now to where I can see things from a distance. Nothing really creeps up on me anymore because I know how to prepare. Kind of like the dad, I'm able to see in the distance, make preparation and not be in that same place. So it's not, you know, the best analogy, but when you talk about foresight and being able to predict what's going to come next, um, it was a setback, but it was also a setup. And so I would not, have, I wouldn't be an attorney. I would not be where I am now had I not dealt with my crazy family and the estate stuff and the failure of that business, particularly and the first business at 21 that ended with a bad partnership. What was the business at 21? Oh, yes. Because um, you were in the I, mortgage industry after that. I was the mortgage industry after that. So because I was closer, I, I started with the mortgage industry about 27. My first business at 21 was a handshake. It was a PR and communications company. And, um, you know, I had a W-2 job before then right out of undergrad. And I was in grad school getting my MBA at the time. And we were doing great. My partner's wife walked in one day. They were having problems. And she was like, well, I'm your new partner. And I'm like, oh, no, you're not. I'm, I don't, you know, I don't know you. And I don't want to be in business with you. So um, we decided to dissolve the company. And there was like the company itself was making money. We had a decent reputation. But I didn't have anything in writing. So that was my first business failure. Was not the last. But that was my first business failure. Because you had you didn't get anything out of it, you just had to walk away. Is that what you're saying? That was your failure because you didn't have anything in writing that you had a, a equal partnership as the other person. Right. The only thing that I walked away with, um, kind of like Tina Turner on what's left got to do with it. I, I took the name, <laughs> but I didn't take any assets. Um, I felt like the name and the goodwill with the name was going to be enough to help me keep going forward. But the partner really funded most of the day-to-day -day operations and I was more of the creative side. So the new company that I had was underfunded. You know, it had the same name, but we couldn't provide services at the same level. So right. at the end of the day, it was a wash. Gotcha. So just be careful when you start a business, make sure you have enough funds. I mean, depending on what it is, of course, because, you know, exactly. some, yeah, some e-commerce doesn't matter. But what, what I'm hearing from you about today is plan better. Plan for a failure plan for what happens is if this, you know, there's, you got to plan for the future plan and plan for in case something happens, which a lot of us don't, we just think it's going to work out. Well, yeah, because we're the best widget maker in town, but you also, you know, you have to have the business side of making widgets. Yeah, so but I, I think a lot of people don't think they make widgets anymore. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's just my example. Ain't it? <laughs> I know, but I mean, it's, it's, Today, it's a little different today. I mean, it's it's so much easier to start a business today. It's so much easier to, I mean, look at us. We're across the country talking and, you know, about on a podcast, which five years ago you couldn't do, right? And now we can do it. I do it from people in Spain, right? And other, London and other places. That's why I set up my studio in my house because I got tired of going in the office at five o'clock in the morning for those podcasts because that's kind of early. So, but I, what I'm getting, what I'm getting at is it's amazing. The technology we have today to do the stuff we have, where like we can talk to you, you can set up our companies from where you live and you don't have to be in the same town as us. And that's makes it so much bigger. One of the things I run into is the fact that I have to be licensed like you in every state that I want to do business in. Well, I don't necessarily want to do business in every state and not I have anything against the states. That's just a lot of cost. But like with my course, which I, cause I had a book that came out in February called financial freedom, building personal wealth or home ownership. And we'll get into that on your podcast, but you know, setting a course up for that book and for other stuff that I do, we would never have been as easy as it is today to do. We're, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, and to be honest, before COVID, I did not think that I would actually be coaching people the same way that I am now. And it just opened up a totally new world for me. I actually got my first coach after COVID. And it just really opened my mind on how many quantum leaps I can have and be so much further in my business if I start working with someone who's been there and done that. So, you know, getting a coach, taking a course is it's different because when I was younger, and I'm not telling you how old I am, 
But it was like, go to, you know, get your high school degree. Then, I mean, your high school diploma. Then it was like, oh, you got to get a degree. Right. Oh, now you got to go to grad school. Well, I'm not the biggest proponent for formal education anymore because there are so many other ways that you can educate yourself and build your business without giving Harvard $200,000 for a degree. So it's out there, but you got to have a plan regardless of what type of business you're in. You need to have a plan for that business and how you're going to grow and scale. Right. And I totally agree with you. Um, but I still, you know, I would, would I go back and not get my MBA? No, I would still get it because I can say I have an MBA. Uh, I mean, it does, depending on where you go to school and what you learn in that school, it's different. Yes, you don't have to have it. But for when I did it, it was about learning how to do business and what, uh, you know, different things where I don't know if it, they all work the same way these days and how education is a little bit different now than it was when we were going through definitely all right three anything else you want to add today before we go did we miss anything because you you as like my myself do a lot of podcasts you are a podcast host just like myself we run these things differently than everybody else usually but is there anything i missed that i didn't ask you that should have been asked I think we covered most of it, but I would like to just give some advice to your listeners. I thought you just did that for 46 No, minutes. no, no. I saved the best for last, Ed. I saved the best uh, for last. If you are in business, you always need to consider the cost of inaction as an entrepreneur. You're thinking that right now my business is going great. I'm making a million dollars a year. But what if you could be making $2 million? If you take some tweaks in your business, you get those quantum leaps, you hire a coach, the cost of you not doing the things that you need to do to move your business forward, the difference between that two million and one million is costing you a million dollars. So I would encourage people just to play big faster. You know, do those things that you need to do to protect your business and put a moat around it. But now you just said about getting a coach. So which coach are we talking about? Are we talking about a coach to help you set up your company or a coach to help you personally grow as an entrepreneur to grow your company? Because you, that's two separate things, right? Yes. I would say, depending on the industry that you're in, get someone to actually help you grow your business. Um, and a coach is different than a mentor. And I don't mean to start a whole other conversation here because we didn't talk about this. But, um, but yeah, getting someone who has been there and done that, who can offer you advice on how to grow your business. Right. I, and we didn't get there about, because I talk about how you need to have a, you need to go to masterminds. And not in your industry, outside of your industry. You can still do it in your industry, but I always go outside because I want to bring stuff back. You got to have a coach, and you and I don't care. Some people call them corner men or corner persons or coach, whatever you want to call them. You need to have somebody to help you grow and become better than where you are. And every coach needs a coach, and you can and a mentor, like you were going to say. Let me last thing I'll like cut in uh, is different. If I'm setting up as a coach or a mentor, I'm going to grow you as far as I can get you. And then you need to go to somebody else. The problem is if you're dealing with a coach and you leave that coach and they get upset about it, you've not been with the right coach. Ed, it sounds like I'm going to have to come back and we can continue this conversation. <laughs> that works for me. Uh, we'll have a, a part two. Part two. Part, part deuce. You know, like, uh, anyway, we'll move on. All right. Three, three, how do people find you? I can't, I can't even say your name now. I apologize. It's oh, not no. you. It's just one of those days. No worries. Um, I have a lot three. of free, I have a lot of free resources, but if you want to talk directly to me, the best way is LinkedIn. I'm at Cherie Speaks on LinkedIn. I also have a monthly webinar that's totally free. I set you up with an asset protection blueprint. And you will actually walk away with a simple plan to get your estate plan started. Um, in January 2024, I'll be launching my entrepreneur's estate plan. And it even has some AI goodies for you. I'm not going to get all into that, but you don't want to miss it, Ed. All right. So they have to find you on LinkedIn. LinkedIn or on my, on my website. At, okay, that's um, what I want. You're, what, right, that you're, I'm trying to help you www.shereeprints.com forward slash AP blueprint. That is the best way to catch me. All right. So that's the blueprint. But if they could just go to your website, which is your name dot mm -hmm. com, which is great. I hope your other stuff's your name dot you know, everywhere. Everything, everything's my name dot com. 
All right. So go there. That's like myself. But if you do the forward, forward slash blueprint, you'll actually get what you're talking about. Yes. AP blueprint for asset protection. Oh, AP gotcha. blueprint. Sorry. I apologize about that. I'll make sure I put in the notes. Sheree, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I, I mean, I know I said in the beginning, I really appreciate it, but I do. I, I could talk to you for like another hour or two. Well, you got to buy lunch then. So, I mean, we can keep going, but you're going to have to eat. I think it's more like dinner, but you know, for you. You're right. <laughs> I'm even past lunch. So you're probably like nighttime. Yeah, we're yeah we're in daylight savings time now, so it is probably dark outside. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, and I look forward to doing your podcast in about, I think, a month. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. All right. Go check her out. That's S-C-H-E-R-R-I-E-L in the name, in your in your website? No, it's just Sheree, Sheree Pierce. Sheree Pierce. All right. So I'm going to do it one more time. S. C H E R R I E P R I N C E dot com. You can do four forward slash AP blueprint and then you will get the information that she was talking about. So go check her out. Let her know you heard, you heard her on the inner Edison podcast and thank you so much for being here. And I had a really nice time talking to you. Thanks.